James Ellis. I'm a, well, I've been working at the university for about um, a year, um, going up for 18 months actually. Um, I'm a psychiatry trainee, uh, but managed to get a clinical lecturer post in medical education, which is fantastic. I am leading on the pilot um, at Nottingham. So yeah, I'm going to talk about a paperless pilot in perspective from Nottingham. This presentation is brought to you today by the letter P. Um, the Nottingham Medical Course. Um, we, not, Nottingham Medical School has been going for uh, just over 30 years, um, I think. Um, the course uh, has sort of evolved um, organically. Isn't a huge uh, amount different to what it was like when we set up and we're looking, we're, there's a lot of curriculum review going on at the moment. As it stands, we've got two streams, or two main streams. We've got the five-year course um, for school leavers, and uh, then the, the graduate entry medical course, which is four years. First three years of the, um, of the course, like most uh, UK courses, is basic sciences. They do a research project in their third year. And then the graduate entry students and the five-year course students all join together for their clinical phases. So fourth year for the five-year course, uh, for the five-year course is, um, Oh, sorry, the, the latter half of third year, it's clinical phase one, they do medicine surgery, a clinical follow-up project, um, infection therapeutics. So that's their first real um, extended uh, bit of clinical practice. Year four, they do um, child health, obs and gynae, psychiatry, healthcare the elderly, and then what we call specials, so all the little things that, that add up into a block. Um, and then in uh, the final year, they do CP3, which is more medicine, more surgery, uh, musculoskeletal, um, special orthopedics, rheumatology, and primary care and critical illness. In all of these phases, they have workplace based assessments, and they're all paper based at the moment. Um, so, our trial is going to, uh, our pilot is going to uh, focus on, on clinical phase three students. Um, I'll tell you a bit about our workplace based assessment um, system which is called MAX. That stands for Mandatory Assessment of Core Clinical Skills, and it's not in an answer to the workplace-based assessment. It was introduced in 2007, uh, 2008. I graduated from Nottingham in 2006, so it was they brought in, obviously, because we weren't doing things right. Um, they wanted to train them a little bit better, um, and they brought this in. It's very clear that it developed organically, and um, it wasn't planned to be how it is now and because of that it's quite a complicated system and it's very resource heavy. Um, that's what one of the Macs looks like and uh, I took this from our logbook for last year and, um, and when I did that I noticed there was a mistake. Um, so we've corrected that in the new one. So, so we're already better than the, uh, than the paper logbook. But that's what the, uh, the paper version of the assessment looks like. And in CP3, they're all mapped to the um, clinical skills and outcomes in tomorrow's doctors. Um, we're moving over to uh, a tablet, and that's what it's going to look like. Um, as you see, we've corrected the mistake. The, the word cannula venflon has become two words. Um, so we're moving on to these tablets uh, for the pilot. Um, at the moment, that paper Thing is in a logbook, which looks like that, and um, across all years of uh, clinical practice at Nottingham, we spend over £30,000 on printing, and it took quite a while to get that figure. Um, there's various barriers, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit later, but one of them is that the person that organises the logbooks is nearing retirement and didn't want to tell us how much they cost, because she knew that we were changing things and she didn't want to. <laughs> so she wanted to just keep things as they were. Finally got the figure from the printers, yeah, over £30,000 a year. These are the most expensive ones. They've got dividers and carbon copy sheets and things like that. Those cost £8.90 each. So we spend, we spend over three and a half grand every year on printing these. And we print 420 copies because we need spares, which then are out of date the following year and get pulled. So it, it's a huge cost um, in terms of uh, money, but also in terms of um, uh, the environment, really. Um, the process that we have at the moment for uh, Max, this is a simplified process. Um, so the student 
we, we give the responsibility to the students, it's their, for their responsibility to sort out their assessments, they have to get them done and, um, and we leave it to them. But they need to identify the assessor, the assessor needs to complete an assessor form to say that they're an assessor uh, and, and to, to agree to an agreement. But that only has to be done once, but the student has to check they've done it and then I've, added, I've took, taken a bit out here, if the, the assessor is um, isn't on the database, they fill the form in, the student has to take the form back and then the administrators have to put them onto a database. So we've got a database of assessors, but there's thousands of assessors over different trusts and if they're trainees, they move every six months or every four months, so we can't keep track of them. So we might have the assessor on the database, but it's got the wrong workplace and it's useless. And we've actually abandoned that because we just thought it's just not working. We were chasing our tails constantly. Um, but it is important that we know who's assessing because we need to know that the uh, competent people are assessing competence. Um, so that's something that we thought about for the trial. Um, the student completes the task, the assessor completes the checklist, signs the form. Um, and uh, when, they've, when they've done that, the student then registers that they've done it on Moodle. So they have it on paper, but they have to say on the computer that they've done it, which is another step that, that adds, um, adds time. Um, we informally look at the database. Um, at the end of the phase, we look to see if there's any blanks in that database. But obviously that database is only contingent on what the students have said they've done. It's not the paper. Um, we take 10% of the sample uh, logbook, or 10 sample of the logbooks to check them physically. That takes quite a while. There's 29 maps in here to check through. Um, and then students with any issues are contacted and we have meetings. So we've got all these areas that are really resource heavy for staff. And I think this is because it's developed organically. No one would have planned the system like this. But it's because this probably started out with two or three different assessments and it's grown to 29, which we've still got the same system, system going. And as I've said, we've dropped parts of this, this process because it's too complicated. Um, there's also some strange anomalies. It doesn't happen in, in CP3, but in psychiatry in, in year four, for some reason, all the assessments, as well as a tick, need the assessor's initials next to each tick. And the assessors don't put the initials on. So then the students have to go back and find the assessors to get the initials put on, which is, you know, it, it, it's ludicrous. And no one would have planned it if they were starting from scratch. So this is our chance to really correct these mistakes and hopefully make a more sensible system. So, as I said, the drivers for our um, pilot um, or to move over to an electronic uh, portfolio are obviously the administrative burden, um, the time it takes is immense, um, and um, printing costs, environmental costs that I've spoken about. Archiving issues as well is, is something um, uh, important. Obviously, these take a huge amount of space, so we don't keep these at the university. These get given back to the student to look after. And um, the problem is, you have to have done all your maths to graduate, so we know you're competent, but this is actually your record of those competencies. We've had at least one time where a student um, wanted to go and work in Australia, and uh, they were asked to prove that they were competent in X, Y, Z. So we said, well, where's your logbook? And they said, oh, well, when I finished uh, medical school, I burnt it. <laughs> um, so, they had, they probably didn't even have the pile of ash. They didn't have the proof that they'd done that. So, if we got rid of these and had it all on the computer, then, you know, we wouldn't have that worry. It'd always be there. Um, also, National Student Survey is a driver for everyone in, in UK universities. Um, anything we can do to sweeten students' time at our, at our institution helps us on the survey and helps us in the league tables and all that kind of stuff. So, so that's one, one uh, driver as well. Some of the barriers and hurdles that we've had, obviously inertia is a big one. Everyone likes the system as it is because they think they understand it or they're frightened of, of change. Obviously there is a huge expense involved, but when we look at the expense of the printing, that offsets a, a big proportion of, of what we'd be spending. Um, we've also got a lot of tech-averse staff Possibly not as many as we, as we think, but we've got some administra uh, administrative staff who are quite tech averse. We've got, I know at least one consultant, uh, ENT surgeon, who refuses to touch computers. So that'll be interesting to see what happens with him. Um, staff anxieties about what, what's going to happen. So I've, um, 
I know that the administrators at each of our clinical sites are quite worried that, oh, students are going to come to me with this device, what, what, I don't know what to do, and, you know, what, what we've done to remove those anxieties or to reduce them as much as possible, we're going to have a stick, because they're still going to have to carry this logbook for the pilot. There's a sticker on the back, explains what to do, but it's also got my email address, I'm going to take all the flack for anything that happens, so I will be the direct point of contact. I'm hoping, touch wood, that there won't be a lot of email because it's pretty straightforward and, and intuitive, but we'll see. Um, University IT, we've had issues as well as Sean um, had. Um, they've been sort of supportive. They've helped us um, get the devices. They've, um, uh, you know, put the the the, uh, the codes on the back of the stickers so that so we know that we've got you know that these are part of the university property. But they won't offer any support. Um, so they want a copy of this sticker as well, so they can just redirect everything to me. Um, and also, there's university policy, policy, politics initiatives that are going on in the university. We need to tally with that, um, which is, is strange because the medical school is sort of semi-autonomous, but we have to work to the university's uh, rules as well. Um, and the university's got big projects going on at the moment that we need to make sure that we are aligned with. Um, so those are the things that we need to kind of think about. Obviously we're going with a pilot rather than diving in feet first. Uh, the main reason is to justify it mainly to the university, to the higher ups. Um, we need to justify the cost. There are strategic considerations, as I've said, there's the university's um, long-term strategic goals that we need to make sure that we um, uh, meet with. And we just need to prove that this concept will work. Um, although I said that IT aren't helpful, I, I'm probably doing them a disservice. They, one of the, the guys that has been uh, involved with it has mentioned it to our um, uh, Pro Vice uh, Chancellor for um, Learning and uh, Teaching, or Teaching and Learning, and he's actually expressed quite an interest. So they were obviously enthusiastic when they talked about it. So we're going we're gonna to hook, uh, hook up with him and, and uh, speak about the project as well. So hopefully things will be uh, smooth sailing uh, after the pilot. What we're going to do, it's only small. We're we, we, using 20 students from the final year. Um, half are going to be loaned a tablet, half are going to use their own device. Um, crucially, we're not going to tell the half that are loaned a tablet not to download the app. And we can see, I think, from looking at how, um, what, what devices the assessments have done, we can see what device they've done on. So, because my personal view is, if I was given one of these, it would go in a drawer and I'd use my iPhone. So, we want that data. I, I know what I want the results to be. I want the results to be that we don't need to buy loads of these. Um, but there are issues. Handing over a cracked iPhone to a consultant doesn't seem that professional, you know. So there are there's, there's issues to consider, um, but I'm hoping that we don't need to to, um, to spend loads on these, especially because I would rather have a good tablet than a cheap bargain basement one. But we'll we'll see we'll see what happens. They are going to have to carry their logbook as a safety net, and we've stressed so much about because at the moment we encourage students to take a photo of their assessments when they've done that, in case this gets left on the books. Um, we stressed about how we're going to make sure that we've got a safety net. So we're going to get the, the, the page signed, but we're not going to bother with the ticks. And we're considering whether we're going to get people to print a screen on the device, but actually, we probably don't need to do that. Um, but we might do that at the beginning to see how it works. Um, as with Sean, although we know that the system works, and we know that other universities have had experience, Putting your trust in it is still, you know, it's something new to us. So we, we're, we're looking at all the uh, all the potential pitfalls. We're going to have regular focus groups. So they have central teaching once a month. I'm going to meet up with those 20 students and um, and discuss, see what they uh, uh, think of, of what's going on, see if there's any improvements. And, and the advantage is, you know, once these are being printed, they're printed. If they have suggestions, then we can implement them. We can change them. Um, to, to make things better. Um, we're also going to get feedback from assessors and the way we're going to do that, um, I still need to write these questions, Simon, um, is 
that we're going to put at the end of the assessment three, maximum four questions for the assessor to give feedback on the feedback uh, on the assessment system. So as part of the student's workplace-based assessment, there'll be four questions at the end saying, I think this is better than paper, I think this is worse than paper, you know those kind of things. And hopefully we'll be able to extract that data from the assessments. Essentially we'll have 20 students, each of them will have 29 assessments, so we'll have a reasonable data set from a range of different assessors to see what they think and if they've got any suggestions of, of, um, of ways we can improve. And they'll all, all have my email address anyway so they can contact me directly with their uh, comments. Um, worst case scenario, if we have um, Luddite consultants refusing to touch these things, they can do it on there and it'll still be valid. So, and I guess in the future, even if we moved over to this entirely, that would still be available as a PDF, and that would be a, a, a you know a stopgap if if we've got people who are really not wanting to touch these things. Um, in terms of recruitment, we sent an email out to all potential students. Within ten minutes, I had about five um, responses, mainly because I think the fifty pound voucher incentive got them you know, going. We're letting them choose where the vouchers from as well. So, um, but they're not getting it till the end. They have to finish. Um, so we've got 49 volunteers out of 421 students, which I think is pretty good. Um, seven needed to be rejected due to um, uh, them starting their CP3 early. So some of the students can start early if they've got commitments later in the year. And uh, the students will be selected on the train back to Nottingham today. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I, thought, I honestly thought I had a week longer. Um, uh, they'll be selected semi-purposively, uh, by which I mean we have got a list of the students and the logbook administrator who's had contact with them throughout their, their first two years of clinical practice has looked at this list and printed it out and written comments next to the names. Now this hasn't been emailed anywhere because we know that students can ask for their data. In fact, this document is in my bag and it stays with me because some of the comments on there we wouldn't want the students to, to read. But we're going to, some of the, most of the students are going to be random. There's a few that we really do want. There's the difficult students. We want, you know, the ones that, that mess things up or tend towards the dishonest. We actually want them in the trial because we want to, we want to see if the difficult students can cope with it. And there's a few that are really good at raising problems, at emailing, at complaining, at those kind of things. We want them as well, because we're going to get data from them. So we're not going to be entirely random. There's a few that we know that we want. There's also a few we need to avoid. But uh, yeah, the, 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 uh, I've been sworn that that, that that stays very safe. So um, uh, it will be destroyed uh, once, uh, once we're done with it. Um, so what we've done so far, we've had, uh, we're quite lucky to have some dedicated time from one of our IT officers, Simon is here, um, and he has uploaded all the existing Macs to uh, my progress and improved on them. He's spotted mistakes, he's changed the, the he made things more consistent, um, and uh, checking and correcting, that's gone on as we've gone through, but I'm going to go through them all um, again this weekend. Um, and informal field testing, but we did have people saying, well, we need to go out to this far flung site and test it. We need to do, well, no, we don't because it doesn't use Wi Fi, so we can just do it, turn the Wi Fi off and do it anywhere, you know. So we're checking, checking that they work. Um, the students have a year to do all these assessments, and most of them don't do them in the first week. So even if things go wrong in the first week, if we've not done the assessments right, if we haven't, um, Set, made the settings um, as we need them. It can be it can be tinkered with. We have made it so that all of the fields have to be filled in before you can submit the assessment, which should avoid any of the problems that we have with psychiatry people having to go back and get signatures or get initials. Um, and as I said, I, I need to develop these feedback questions that I'm going to get some at least a little bit of assessor feedback um, so that we've got something to uh, uh, to work on. Particularly important because in the last week we've decided that I'm going to do a PhD on this, so I need a bit more data. <laughs> so that should help. Um, then hopefully we'll be rolling this out 
if we can prove it works, uh, which I'm sure we will, um, and that will form part of my project as well. So, um, some of the issues and challenges that we have, uh, something that we just discussed before, the, the, the issue of provide a device or bring your own device. And I think we keep flip-flopping between where, where our answer lies, really. I think my ideal situation would be it would be a bring your own device system, but we'd have 30, 50 of these in the library that can be taken out on, on a 12 week library, or you know, so that no one's disadvantaged if they don't have a, have a smartphone or don't have a tablet, but equally, no one is given a tablet they don't want or don't need. So that, that's my, my personal uh, preference, but we'll see what happens. Um, also, about the tablet, do we lock them, do we not? Um, we, uh, we have actually found some friendly IT people who do want to support us and um, sort of off the radar. And they talked about locking the devices so that they can't download other apps and things like that. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm partial to leave it unlocked because there's a lot of other things you can do with the tablet and, and I think we should allow them to do that. And that can be part of the focus group to see what they do with the tablet. We don't want it just to be a brick that does, um, does workplace-based assessments and nothing else. Um, the one issue we have had, um, and it shouldn't be too bad for 20 tablets, but uh, for 10 tablets, but for, if we go on it might be a bit uh, uh, tricky, is that to download apps, even though it's a free app, you have to put a credit card in. So it's got my credit card details on the account. Oh, is it not that? Ah, Slime has worked out a way to do it now, excellent. So my, um, you need a password anyway, so they're not going to steal things. And I have been checking my account so that Slime has not been downloading <laughs> Minecraft. Um, but the other thing that challenge or issue, and it may, may well be that these people don't exist, but we've got this sort of mythical Machiavellian student in our head that's going to try and get around the system. And as Sean was saying, we've wrapped our brains on how they can get around the system. And, and we thought, well, you know, if, if they really want to get around the system, I'm sure they'll find a way. Um, the concerns we, I've had are, you know, how do we know, if you hand a tablet over, how do we know that the student is who they say they are. But equally, you can hand over someone else's logbook. You've got the wrong name on, but who checks? Um, so we've added a, 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 a thing that says, uh, one of the, the checklists that it is, I've checked student's identity. Um, and they get an email back as well. So at least they get an email saying, you have done an assessment on this person. The one thing that I, we have spoken to my progress about is the fact that the date stamp is the date it was uploaded rather than the date it was completed. And I think that's something that you might be looking at. But um, we've had to put in a free text box that's saying what date the actual assessment was completed. Um, but I think there's, in, there's enough safeguards to, um, to outwit these Machiavellian students. And, and as, as we said, the, they would, they, if they exist, they're going to, you know, giving them devices isn't going to make them any more evil. Uh, you know, Dr. Shipman with a tablet was still Dr. Shipman. You know. um, but there's going to be culture change. Um, students at Nottingham, I don't know about other institutions, are incredibly reliant on paper. If you don't give them handouts in lectures, they go crazy. And they probably don't ever look at them again. But they, everything they want printed. So as well as that, for, for, for the final year, they get that, but they also get a study guide, which is a little bit thinner. doesn't have the dividers, but that still costs about three grand. And what, why won't a PDF do? Um, so we need to get rid of their, their uh, reliance on paper. And also, we need to support tech versus staff and students. I think it's going to be more so staff um, in, in moving over to this kind of uh, device. But I think that as long as we've got safety nets that if we have real problems, there's still a way for students to do their assessment on paper or, or however, it'll still be a lot less of a cost and environmental burden than, uh, than it is at the moment. So um, that's, that's everything from me. If anyone's got any questions now, that would be fantastic. If anyone wants to email me equally, I'm more than happy to, uh, uh, to take questions, comments, discussion. So um, yeah. Yeah. So last chance for questions. I'll be around all the time.
I just wanted to clarify, it's picking up on the point the lady there made earlier, about mm -hmm. the sign-off process. So for, my understanding is somebody does a, an assessment, mm -hmm. they put in an email address mm -hmm. of the person that's observed them, say, mm -hmm. that goes to the individual's email box, mm -hmm. and if they have any concerns as mm -hmm. a process, if they don't have any concerns, the assessment is signed off, is it? Yes. Yes. So, so if somebody, one of your Machiavellian students, mm. were to put in a major female address, mm. it relies on the mentor or the tutor to see it? Well, um, it does, but um, they'd have to make up an email address that was the right form. So it'd have to be a nottingham.ac.uk address or a not so address. Can't, so they can't put a Yahoo. Well, they can, can, but it's going to show up on the database. And, it's, and it shows up pretty quickly, doesn't it, yeah, Sharon? But you know, the database is reliant on the mentor or the supervisor. No, so, so, so when all, all, the, all the data that, that, that's put into the assessment yeah. can be extracted as an Excel file. Yeah, you can, it, it yeah. takes minutes to check it. You can literally just go through the file really quickly and if any Yahoo yeah. You can actually spot them really quickly. So, you, so you get so part of, so the sign off the the, mm -hmm. the name of the person and the email address is part of that data. Right. That goes into our database. It, um, so that, as Sean says, we print it. it we, we get it on, on the screen. Scroll down, and any any email addresses that don't match up will jump out. Of those. So there's a governance sort of process yes. done by an administrator. So there will be a checking. Yeah. Is there a mechanism for flipping that so that the assessor? has to say yes it's okay rather than it's not okay. Um, no, there is no, no, no. Um, <coughs> I think one of the some of the early feedback that we had was that the the institutions didn't want to put a massive workload onto the observers. So that's why we avoided that. Mm -hmm. But it is something that's come up, so it's something that we're still looking okay. at. Something else that we're looking at for version six is the idea of whitelisting certain domains so that it's not actually possible to put in the Yahoo address because the system will mm -hmm. accept uh, NHS mm -hmm. okay. email address or whatever. So I think that's something that we're, that we're going to do, if not for the next release, then for a release fairly soon. I guess the other thing is that. Um, if people put up completely made up email addresses, they're going to get a bounce back. That bounce back goes to the administrator, so they have a, a, yeah. a, a higher priority of the mm -hmm. that. I, th I think it's, this sort of stresses as well that you you make the rules, mm -hmm. you know. And I think what James is illustrating is really well thought out pilot and so on with, with safety and things like that. Uh, I know Gareth from Leeds. He always says, you know, the fear of actually getting thrown off the course and everything for, for doing something like this mm -hmm. is, is quite high, mm -hmm. you know, for, for, for medical yeah. students and so on. But if you set the rules, mm -hmm. uh, you know, know, you know, the right kind of email address and all this kind of stuff, and they know that they're going to be looked at, uh, that, that sh should be enough. I think the, the thing with, that, with identifying assessors, we, we try to think of a fail-safe way of doing it, but there isn't, because we were, we were asking for, we thought, well, we can ask a registration number. But um, whereas doctors have to give their uh, GMC number, uh, nurses don't have to give their NMC PIN. And a lot of our assessments are done by nurses. So we've got nurse educators at different sites who will do um, things like cannulation and catheterization, and they'll sign, sign the medical students off for that. And they're not obliged to give their PIN. So we couldn't say that you have to have a registration yeah. Also, we can't say you have to have a trust email address because some of the um, assessments are done by GPs. And whereas GPs are supposed to use an NHS.net address, many of them don't. They'll have practice domain addresses, those kind of things. So there were always exceptions to the rules. So we couldn't bring in those kind of rules. Um, but we, we tried to make it as tight as possible. And I think with 20 students, it's going to be manageable to, to, um, to keep an eye on things. And it will point us in you know, the direction we need to go in when, when we roll it out. We roll it out. Okay, thank you so much. Oh, sorry, one last question. That, that kind of brings up the mm. point I was going to ask. Was, um, is it a pilot in the sense of deciding whether you introduce it at all? Or is it a pilot, you are going to be introducing it, it's just uh, ironing out the wrinkles as you... It depends you who's seeing the video, really. Um, it's, <laughs> it's a pilot in the sense that from... From a medical education unit point of view, we we very recently set up an assessment team at the university when um, my boss, who is head of um, 
assessments and uh, examinations took over uh, in her post, she was very keen to, to move to this. And, and I think if she had her way, we'd move straight to it. Uh, but it's more of a dotting the I's and crossing the T's um, job. It does help that she's now acting head the Dean of Medical Education. So, um, so it's possible that <laughs> we'll have more sway in, in so, but, but are there any things that you can do in terms of actually measuring whether it improves the quality of education in any way? Or whether it, or whether it is just, uh, makes everybody's life a lot easier in terms of administration? I think, it, I think it's more the latter, really. I, I think, um, as far as the, the background to, to why we do the assessments, it is to ensure that we're ticking the tomorrow's doctor's boxes. You could, you, um, could, you could look at attrition rates, failure rates, mm. um, whether you actually pick people, students actually could look at what has an impact on your NSS score, but there's lots of other things that you're actually doing. I think, I think the thing is that the, the, the level that the MACs are set at is they're not, very, very few people fail them. You know, they're not difficult things because they're what's expected as F1 standards. So they're not particularly tricky. And also they pick when they do the assessment and they pick who the assessor is. So they wait until they're good enough to do it. Um, they know that if they, if they fail and assess the, the max, it has to be then done by someone else. Um, and if they fail it a third time, it has to be done by a head of clinical skills. Very, very few get to that stage because they're actually really simple things to do. So I'm not sure that we could get that data about whether it's educationally beneficial. Um, but there's so much more. The, we, the pilot originally was just to cover um, workplace based assessments for Max. When we realized that we could copy and paste everything across, we thought it'd take time and ages to get everything across, but you did it in a few days. <laughs> so um, we've now moved on to the sign-offs for the different attachments which in here are four carbon copy pages. Uh, we have managed to condense them and, uh, and put them onto to my progress. And we were stressing about whether we got the formatting right, but then we realized, well, they don't need them till at least eight, 10 weeks in, so we can, we can relax on those. We can just send them out later. Um, but, so we're gonna expand it a little bit. But there, you know, there's so much more that, that my progress can do. So the things like, the reflections, those kind of things, can be done on my progress. It, can, it will, if we use it eventually, replace this entirely. And this will be relegated to a PDF that no one ever looks at, which would be great. Okay, that's great. Thanks. I think we had one more question. Oh, it's just the, um, just to follow on from the earlier comment, you know, around the validity of the sign off. I suppose it's still as many errors as a signature of promotion yeah. activity as much as it would be for entry of promotion of email address. So yeah. it's more, I, it's much the same really, you know, the errors well, are going to try and I think it is more secure actually. Mm -hmm. I think it's much harder. Well, this is the thing we've got signatures that you don't, don't look the same twice, and you know, and people will sign them and, and they'll put sparse details about who they are and where they are. And, the advantages of, of the way we set it up, you can't submit the form without filling in every box. So they have to put something, um, and at least we can track them down. And, and the database is, wasn't used worth, worth the paper it wasn't printed on. Because, um, <laughs> it, you know, we had this database of, of foundation year two doctor who was working in this the department. But by the time that we got around to checking, they moved on. So, you know, What's the point of keeping those things? I think that I think that um, we we're very, we're all very worried about the dangers, but I think that they're, they're probably few and far between. And you know, the Machiavellian ones may well slip through the net, but they would slip through the net in this system. It, you know, Harold Shipman practiced for a long, long time. Um, we're not going to catch everyone. But okay, that's, that's, that's a cheery note to end on. <laughs> <laughs>